It's a foggy morning on the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. Northwest Outdoors is at Lake Quinault Lodge with a group of hikers ready to explore the Quinault Rainforest. Located in the Olympic National Forest, this temperate rainforest contains some of the oldest trees in the world. My name is Daniel Hall, and this is going on the 11th year for myself working for the Forest Service as an interpretive naturalist. I like to share with folks, it's basically just a fancy term for somebody that likes to talk a lot. It's what I do for my job. I don't just talk about anything, what I try to do is make tangible connections between people and the environment. What you see out here, why does the Quinault Valley look the way it does? During the summer months, kind of Ranger short, Daniel like Hall takes visitors time, but, through uh, the rainforest um, and points out many of the characteristics of this special region. This is the beginning of the three-mile Gatton Creek hike. The trail winds through the old growth, reaching an elevation of only 550 feet. It's an easy hike to go alone, but having a guide can bring this world biozone to life. I'm going to take a stop right around here. One of the things that uh, draws people into this area is the fact that we are in a temperate rainforest. We are actually in uh, uh, the this largest se section of temperate rainforest in the world. 66% uh, of the world's temperate rainforest uh, goes from uh, the coast of Alaska all the way down into the coast of Oregon. Here in the Olympic Peninsula, uh, we have a, an exquisite example of that due to the fact that the Olympic Mountains are so close to the coast. They trap the moisture off the coast, releasing the 150 inches of rain that we annually get here. 150 inches of rain does grow some of the largest tree species of their kind in the world. And I'd say that's a really big draw for a lot of folks. But if it's not just big trees that you're looking for, it's also the wildlife that can be found in these areas. Wildlife such as Roosevelt elk, black bear, cougars, bobcat, also uh, the, the uh, ever-present banana slug. Um, we have banana slugs that can grow to be about 12 inches long. Once again, uh, the amount of rainfall is the biggest driving reason why people might want to come out here. We grow things very large. These trees right here, uh, about to 80 years of age, um, tend to be sort of like adolescent, uh, adolescent trees due to the fact that uh, they're really screaming for the canopy. A lot of competition happening right here. No regards for what's really going to happen to them. Uh, they're spending all their energy shooting up into the forest uh, canopy there, and in some cases not rooting themselves down uh, properly. Therefore, you're getting this uh, selection process. It's not uncommon for 70 mile an hour winds to come through this forest, and in this 70 mile an hour winds, if you don't anchor yourself properly, you become a piece of down dead woody material. One of the faces that people can associate with a temperate rainforest uh, is a face next to water. Uh, it has to be a face that looks like this one back here. Um, what you're looking at back here is a big leaf maple, and it is covered in epiphytic moss. Ooh, that's a fancy Ooh, word, isn't it? Epiphytic? Epiphytic, yes. All the moss that you see kind of clinging onto this tree here isn't really taking anything from the tree. One of the most common questions I get asked as a naturalist happens to be is, is the moss hurting that tree? And I have to appropriately say, well, no, actually it's not. It's just kind of hanging out there. Epiphytes, once again. A plant that grows on another plant but does not take anything from the host. Towering fir and cedar trees are giants looking down at visitors. This nature walk is one of many trails that snake through this area. Most are just a few miles long, allowing hikers to get up close and personal with the unique features of a rainforest. We have uh, our recreational loop trail system. It is about uh, 10 to 13 miles, actually, of trail that is relatively accessible uh, in several different loops. The prime destination for folks coming out here, is staying at Lake Quinault Lodge or one of our several campgrounds, is, is hiking our recreational loop trail system and perhaps actually maybe even catching an interpretive hike with a naturalist such as myself. We do have 16 trailheads here in the Quinault Valley, uh, going from the National Forest into the National Park. We have uh, trails that go up to large old growth cedar trees, uh, one off our recreational loop trail system. And there's uh, another cedar tree on the other side of the lake that actually happens to be a world contender. It's a quarter mile trail. It's in the National Park that goes up to one of the world's largest western red cedar trees. It's uh, over uh, 13, 1400 years old. We will be right back with more from the Quinault Rainforest on the Olympic Peninsula. 
plus a look at the historic Lake Quinault Lodge. Construction took 53 days. They worked by um, bonfire every night um, to try to beat the rainy season. They opened August 18th. First, here's a way to enjoy the outdoors with this tip for better nature awareness from survival instructor Frank Sherwood. Would you like to see more animals out in the woods? Would you like to hear more birds out there? Here's a few tips in nature awareness to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Here's the first tip I'd like to show you. It's called the fox walk. It slows us down and quiets our walk down. What I want to do is take the outside of our foot and just gently lay it down on the side there. We lay it down on the edge, lightly roll it in as we walk. This slows us down and this quiets our walk down so we can see more animals while we go out there. The next tip I want to show you is what we call wide angle vision. And what that does is opens our vision to taking in the whole picture. Instead of focusing on one thing, we can use our fingertips to test us. We bring our hands out to our sides and wiggle our fingertips. And when we can see our fingertips moving at the sides, we're taking in the whole picture, not focusing on one thing. Our side vision, or our peripheral vision, is great for picking up movement. And when we see that movement, is what we can do is then look over and check it out and focus in on it and tell what it is. And then we can go back to, okay, that was a bird. And we can go back to our wide angle and continue fox walking till we see something else in our wide angle vision and look over at it. Okay, that's a rabbit in the brush moving. Come back over. And that's how you want to see out in the woods. Use wide angle vision all the time while you're out there. The final tip I'd like to share with you today is what we call focused hearing. Take your hands, cup them, and then lightly put them behind your ears and gently, just a little bit, pull your ears out. Just a little bit. And what this does is funnel the sound into our ears so we can hear it at greater distances and louder tones. So remember these three tips that I've told you about. Fox walking, wide angle vision, and focused hearing. If you can learn those three tips and practice them, they'll enhance your outdoor experience immensely. Underneath the canopy of the Quinault Rainforest, the ground is teeming with life. Evidence that this world biozone is active and growing every second. Guide Daniel Hall and his hiking group are halfway through their three mile Gatton Creek adventure. This is a really good place to I guess just kind of mention uh, the shallow root systems that we have here in this forest. As you can see here uh, on a tree, these roots don't go any more than about a foot or so into the ground. Once again, we receive 12 feet of annual rainfall. It's an energy equation. You know, do, you know, if you don't have to go deep for water, why would you possibly want to do that? You know, less energy expenditure, you get more water right close to the surface. What we're looking at here is a cedar tree that was cut down, uh, most likely due to a visitor's carelessness. Um, somebody probably walked by the trail, uh, threw some sort of an ignition source into the inside of this tree, which was hollow. Typically trees, as they get very old, uh, the center of the tree has been dead for quite some time. Um, and basically what happened is a fire started in the center of this tree. By the way, I will share, if anybody was caught catching this tree on fire, they could be fined. Recently, somebody uh, was caught poaching a tree uh, or a cedar tree off the National Forest land, and they were fined, I believe it was $230,000. Uh, for cutting down that tree. Once again, that's not the stump value, that's the value, an assessed value of what that tree is worth when it's 700 years old. This is one of the largest Douglas firs. Um, 
there are. Once again, there are several other champions that are at this size, but once a tree gets this size, they don't get much bigger. Somebody can argue there's two or three inches here or there at the diameter at the base that might give you a little bit more. And the mound of material that's sitting around the tree, this actually tree prov kind of provides or, or creates its own little ecosystem around it as it's growing, as the bark sloughs off this tree. Basically, people are amazed with the size of the trees that we have here. Once again, we have several world contending trees. Um, some of the largest Douglas fir, some of the largest hemlock, some of the largest red cedar, some of the largest spruce that you'll see anywhere in the world. Uh, you can do that all right here in the Quinault Valley. Uh, also, um, I, I believe our moss community, uh, our epiphytes, uh, mosses, lichens, and liverworts uh, that are found out here, 1,400 different kinds of these things. Uh, in some cases, they can drape um, six, seven, in some cases up to 12 feet off some branches. And it's just very scenic. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to come out here yeah. in the early morning <laughs> and see the sun peering through some, uh, some moss that's draping, um, uh, really moist <laughs> with water droplets coming off it and the sun pirouetting through there, it's, it's amazing. Connecting visitors to this temperate rainforest hey, is what Naturalist Hall <laughs> does best. Before ending his interpretive hikes, Ranger Dan gives the group one more piece about the rainforest to remember. Than it is. Now, taking uh, the word owls, O-W-L-S, you can remember the four scientific criteria of an old growth forest, and they are old live trees. Next one, we got O-W, wood on the forest floor. Next thing we're gonna be looking at <clears throat> It's going to be L, I just mentioned that again, it happens to be with the younger trees, the medium trees, and the older trees all in the same forest, it happens to do with layering in the canop canopy, the cycling of life, death, and rebirth. And the last one is uh, the S, snags, standing dead trees. Old, woody, layered snags. You just scientifically remember the four criteria of an old growth forest. There's a lot to learn about the rainforest on these short two and a half hour hikes. When the hike does wind down, most hikers aren't too sore from the miles put in. They are sore though from the rubbernecking of the wonders above. The Quinault Valley is part of a complex of rainforests on the Olympic Peninsula. The Ho, the Queets, and the Quinault rainforests attract millions of visitors a year. Nearby is the pristine Lake Quinault. This body of water supports plenty of fishing for steelhead, rainbow trout, and salmon. With a 25 mile loop road around the lake, plenty of access makes it ideal for boating and sightseeing as well. One of the lodges that cater to visitors in this area is the historic Lake Quinault Lodge. Whether staying here or stopping by, the history of this lodge is evident creating a perfect fit in this lush valley. We started construction in June of 1926. Um, construction took 53 days. They worked by um, bonfire every night um, to try to beat the rainy season. They did it by incorporating 45 local craftsmen from the Pacific Northwest. And this area here was slated for a national park back in uh, 1933. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt came out here in 1937 um, in order to view the area and shortly thereafter um, th this was designated as a national park. Before sitting down for a boiled Chinook salmon lunch that October day in 1937, Roosevelt was quoted as saying this is one of the most beautiful settings I've ever seen. Nine months later on June 29th, 1938, Roosevelt signed a bill establishing the Olympic National Park. Because the Quinault Valley is rich in history and scenery, the lodge has incorporated a special activity. To get a different perspective of the area, an interpretive boat ride is offered. Retired park ranger Roger Blaine takes sightseers around the lake to learn more about this special ecosystem. I'd like to welcome you to the wettest place in the continental United States, Lake Quinault in the Quinault Rainforest. My name's Roger. I am a retired National Park Ranger from Olympic National Park and other parks. 
Spent about 26 years with the Park Service and I retired three years ago. And I think I've been hanging around the house too much because my wife is a waitress here at Lake Quinault Lodge. And the manager called her this spring and said, you know what, we bought a tour boat and we need someone to develop a tour and operate it for us on the lake. Would your husband be willing? And she said, sure he would. <laughs> and when I got home that night, I had a job. So here I am. <laughs> That's fantastic. The lake is four miles long and two miles wide. It's 270 feet deep. It's a totally natural glaciated lake. The glaciers were last here about 14,000 years ago. And when they receded, they played a dirty trick on us. The upper river, which feeds the lake, drains 290,000 acres of those mountains up in the valley there, the interior of the Olympic Mountain Range. Now, if you take our normal rainfall of 140 inches, and very often a lot more than that, you take that much rainfall in a compressed time frame and dump it on steep mountains like we have right out here in front of us, all the water comes to this lake. So the water level on this lake can and does rise 10 or 12 feet overnight. Wow. Overnight. <laughs> it is not at all unusual to have that happen. It'll happen three or four times every winter season. It's quite dramatic. One of our active bald eagle nests is right straight ahead in that large tree with the nest about six feet from the top of it. Uh, the children, the kids, have flown the coop, so to speak, and there goes Dad over there off to the left, flying around by that dead tree. The incredible diversity of the water, forest, and wildlife makes this one of the gems of the Pacific Northwest. Few get to enjoy it and appreciate its value like the people that work here. To me, the, the value of this area is in the incredible diversity in Olympic National Park and Olympic National Forest. Between the two, just in this valley, we have about a million and a half acres of federally designated wilderness area. In the National Park here, we have 60 glaciers in the upper elevation of the interior of the Olympics here. We have wild rivers and streams migrating salmon in the fall and winter of the year. We have the Roosevelt elk. The bull elk can reach up to a thousand pounds and they are the primary reason that Olympic National Park was created in 1938 to protect the Roosevelt elk. The world's largest Sitka spruce tree is right off of the bow gate. With a rainforest walk and an interpretive ride on the lake, the ecosystems of the Quinault Valley are easy to appreciate. One thing you won't want to forget when visiting this area is a camera. Now here is a great tasting recipe for the outdoors from Northwest Outdoors fishing host Hobart Mans, apple quesadillas. We're here in the elk camp in the center of the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, and we're going to do another camp dessert or camp pastry. It's one of those little things that don't take a lot of time. They are very, very tasty. And you could put it in your pocket and take it out in the woods with you when you hunt. So what we're gonna do is finish peeling this apple that I started here before you showed up. We're gonna slice off the uh, chunks here so we get away from the seeds into this bunch that I've already cored ahead. We're gonna take a taco shell and put it in a skillet I'm going to put the skillet on the heat here for just a second. Get some heat underneath there. I've got some butter in there I want to melt. And I want to get this taco shell coated on both sides with the butter. I'm going to put it back in the um, heat over here. Get a lifter. As it bubbles up in that butter, we're going to put it in the uh, skillet there's a flour tortilla with the butter. Now you see it's starting to bubble up or get a little crust to it. And this whole recipe moves quite rapidly. Kind of a quesadilla type thing. We're going to turn that over in the butter. I want to get both sides coated very nicely. Get over there. There they go. 
they're bubbling up. Now to that, we're going to take some of the apples that we have pre-sliced, and I want to slice enough apples thinly to cover the face of half of that shell. Kind of have to move quickly here so that we don't have too much heat and too much problems. Probably need another piece of apple, one about that size ought to do it. Get that sliced in here. To that, we're going to add cinnamon and we're going to add brown sugar. We're going to fold that edge over, put that down, get the apple spread about. Brown sugar is right here. We're going to add about a spoonful, sprinkle some of that around so we get it on all sides of it. Add a little cinnamon for flavor. My spatula lifter. Take and fold that shell over in half. Those apples will cook and that's going to make a pastry. And it's an easy thing to do with in camp with apples. Again, you're dealing with a situation where nothing spoils, the apples won't spoil, the tortilla shells won't spoil, the spices don't spoil, so you can keep it for a long time and cook them in camp anytime you want to. If you want to, really want to, you can turn around and make some fried apples and serve it on top of these even to make it just a little bit better. This one is probably almost done. We're gonna take it out, add it with the other one. There's another apple quesadilla for Elk Camp. Finished perfectly, tasty, easy to make. Learn more about this show, number 1608, by going online to northwestoutdoors.org. Set the hook. Fish on. He's on the surface, coming to the boat. On the next Northwest Outdoors, there's plenty of excitement in Canada while fishing for Chinook and silver salmon at Nootka Island Lodge on Vancouver Island. Here comes. Nice silver one too, eh? Great, always oh, a hog, look at that, eh? Ooh, he's a beaut, easy. Can't see him in the bloody sunlight. Come on out. Yeah. There he goes. Good tip for fishing out here, when you see your bite, grab the rod. If there's any slack whatsoever, you wind down until you feel tension, palm the reel so when you set the hook, line doesn't spool out and you give it slack and lose it right away. Easy. Just keep your tip up as high as you can. Just like that, there's a beauty. And keep the line tight, and you'll land a slab just like that. There's a nice slab. Beautiful fish. That's what we're after. Nice little tie. That should go up 31, 32. Anyways, Plus, making cedar barbecue. plank salmon on the barbecue. That's on the next Northwest Outdoors. Funding for North